We'll be watching a very long silent movie, which may not be very useful. All right, so let's get back to. Okay, let's get rid of this. Those are from my other <laughs> class. This is just me testing out you know, several things. You know, I'm testing out Google Drawing um, just for the future, not for this semester, but in the future, I want to see if I can use uh, Google Drawing instead of my document camera in class. So this way, you know, I can get everything captured on screen without using a piece of paper. So that's about it. And this is the exam for the other class, and we are going to go through the practice exam for this class at least a little bit today. You know, I may not be able to get through every single thing today, but we do have one more lecture on Thursday. So this is the second last day, and then Thursday is the last day. All right, cool. All right. So first thing is to a little bragging about my assembler that is written in the form of a spreadsheet. So I actually did it. Um, there's a little bit of instruction. You know, this is actually accessible to you as well. If you, you if you want to, you can make a copy and mess around with it. So this is sort of readme page. And if you go to the source, this is directly copied and pasted from the uh, sample program that we worked on last Thursday. So it's exactly the same program. I opened it in mouse pad. You can do it in mouse uh, notepad as well. Copy, control, control A, control C to copy onto the clipboard, and then just paste it into the spreadsheet. Okay, so this part is something that you have to, you have to paste into. And for those of you who do not really care about how it's done, you can just skip to the last tab here, and that's the actual assembled program. Hmm. It can, it's not universal, okay? This is not quite as flexible as what a commercial assembler is. Um, it cannot handle uh, general expressions. It cannot handle a lot of things, but it can handle labels. We can resolve labels. And um, so if you look at the original source code, it has got labels, like on row eight, you know, we have a label. And then when you look at the actual output, um, it resolves the label correctly. So I think the labels, this is a label reference, and there are other ones too. So I just found it kind of you know, interesting um, and be able to do it in a, using a, just a spreadsheet. So all the parsing you know, and all the interpretation, it's all done e using a spreadsheet. So for those of you who, okay, I can see most of you are not interested, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just early. It's okay. It's um, it took me, actually, you know, if you look at the property of the document, it probably has, um, that information. Nope. Sorry? Revision history. Revision history. There we go. So I started at about 9.30 and it was pretty much done by um, midnight on that day. So about three hours. So this is the page that's actually doing all of the actual work to assemble it? Yes. So this, this between this sheet, which is you know a description. In other words, this is actually this is data driven. driven. Yeah, this is actually data driven. So we have you know the actual op code, the numeric on one side, the base op code in hexadecimal on another column, and then these things are all basically said. If there's a register X, which what is the position of register X? If there's a, a register Y, where is the position of register Y? Zero means the first, and one means the second. Um, and then if there's an immediate constant or literal constant, where is it, okay? Because there's one that is at the second place and the one is at the first place. This is the regular expression to extract the register, and this is register X, this is the regular expression to extract register Y, and then the last one, let me quickly go through that, okay. And then column I is, okay, column I, yeah, this comment too. Um, this one, column H here specifies if you do have a register X, how many bits it is supposed to be shifted in the actual opcode. And then the other one specifies if you have a register Y, how many bits you know, is it going to be shifted in the actual opcode, um, and that's it. So this table is the actual data that is driving the other page. 
So the other page or the other sheet, okay, in the spreadsheet is this one. This one has got a, a few more columns, okay, not too bad. It's up to Y only. So there are only 25 columns in this case. And some of these are duplicates, you know, just for um, convenience, you know, purposes. So this one actually extracts different parts of, the, of each line. If it's a label definition, column B will indicate it is a label definition. And then column C identifies what kind of instruction it is. So this seven is mapping to row seven of the mnemonic sheet because it looks it up and says, oh, okay, this is you know, corresponding to row seven on the other sheet. So once it knows you know, what instruction we're dealing with, it will then extract the operand, okay? It will extract the first operand and the second operand. And then it will try to find out, do we have a register zero? That's oh, yeah. huge. Do we have a red, you know, what is it? What is register zero? And so on. So it, it really just does it step by step. Um, so for those of you who are interested, you know, this is, Obviously, open sourced. Okay, you know you can make a copy of that and uh, just kind of find out what it, what kind of stuff it uses. Um, and I also wrote a manual. <laughs> so this is a manual to show you guys how to use it. It will start with uh, copyright notice. Okay, so I don't want anyone to <coughs> copy this stuff. You know, put that person's name on it and sell it. Okay. Not that anyone, not that I really see anyone in this class being interested in this material past the final exam. <laughs> Up to the final exam, maybe, but after the final exam, no. Okay, so I described the syntax of the assembly language, which is the same thing that we have been using. Um, I redescribe all the instructions. So Hulk is kind of the same thing as the infinite loop. It does not get out, okay? Because once you get to the Hulk instruction, it does not proceed any further. Okay, it just stops. So it's the same thing as a forever loop in C. Uh, no op is just doing nothing. This is supposed to be curly braces, by the way. Open and close curly braces. So I just read this by all the instructions um, and the syntax of, of, those, of, uh, of all those instructions. Um, and this one talks about the basic architecture, which is nothing new to us. Okay, I'm just putting in the description here. And this is the basic instruction of how to assemble, which we'll be using a little bit today. And for those of you who are curious about the spreadsheet implementation of an assembler, okay, this part kind of gives you a brief explanation of what each column does inside the spreadsheet. Okay. Are we okay so far? Okay. So we're going to use this tool today because I'm going to give you a few examples to work on. And as we work on some of these examples, we are going to introduce new concepts, okay? Not new instructions, just new way of using the instructions. So we go to the share folder, and I have few, a, a few examples. So I'm gonna, I will start with this one, okay? So this one is, okay, let's skip the first part, okay? So we'll skip all the first part here. And this particular one is just a C program, or something that looks like a C program, and I want to do it in assembly. Okay, I want to implement this entire program in assembly, and it, all it does is to compute the factorial of a number, which you have seen many, many times, okay? But this is it's recursive. So let's just take a quick look at these things and see whether we know what to do with it. The keyword register is actually recognized by most compilers. It is an ANSI standard. Um, but in this case, I'm really just saying that A is a register. That's all I'm saying, okay? A is an eight register, um, and the value is supposed to be unsigned. And I want it to store the factorial of three, okay? So the factorial function is down here, okay? So when you look at the factorial function, um, this part here is also indicating that parameter A is also stored in the register, okay, in register A. <coughs> and then the rest of the code is the usual stuff that you use, that you see in a factorial subroutine if A is non-zero. Now, because A is unsigned, it cannot be negative. So the only chance that it can be non-zero is if it is a positive value, okay? So if A is positive, even if it's one, I do the recursion. So it will return the value of most, which is a multiply function up here, because I don't have the op multiply operator. Um, it will multiply A, which is my own parameter, 
to the factorial of a minus one, which we already know is the definition, recursive definition of factorial. But how do we implement this in assembly? That is the big question. Okay, so we're going to address this one. Um, else is corresponding when a equals to zero, the factorial of zero is one, so I just return a constant from here. Is that okay so far? So don't worry about the actual mechanism to implement it, just understand the logic of the C code for now, okay? And then multiply is something that you have seen already in your second exam, okay? But in this case, I use a loop to do it. Instead of using, you know, like, just replicate the same block of code several times, I just use a loop to do it. Okay. All right. So, so this one is there are a few things that we need to understand first before we go back to uh, the factorial program. Oh, by the way, you know this is one form of question that you may find in the exam. Is I'll give you the mnemonics, and then you have to decompile this code and show me what is the structured C <laughs> code corresponding to it. Now this one we have seen many times already. This is like the third time we see it today within the last 20 minutes. This is our recursion program that we worked on Thursday. So we'll talk about you know, how to decompile a program. How do you, what do you use to recognize features and say, oh, okay, I can see this one is you know, this kind of C construct and this one over here is corresponding to this kind of C construct. So we'll talk about that. Yep. And the final is also open notes. Yes, the final is open book, open notes. If you feel that a scientific calculator can be helpful, bring it with you. I don't think it will be very necessary, but it all depends on how comfortable you are with hexadecimal numbers and decimal, because there will be a little bit of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we'll, we'll deal with this one later as well. So the first thing we want to do is to say, okay, but how do we return a value? Okay, so I have a very simple subroutine called five, okay, you should call it joining, but this is five, and all it does is to return the literal value of five. So now the question is, well, how do we write a subroutine to do exactly that? In other words, the question is, what is the mechanism of returning a value from a subroutine? What do you think? Yep. You have to have somewhere to store that value where the code that called that function can grab it. That is correct. It's an agreement between the caller and the callee. Okay, the called subroutine and the caller, they have to agree on where do I find the return value? When control is getting back to the caller, the caller needs to go to that place and say, okay, oh, here's the return value. Okay, so very good. Okay, so that's the minimum requirement of a return value mechanism. So in most compilers for most architectures, a return value that is a scalar, which means it's an integer of some kind or even a float, um, is usually returned by registers. Okay. Now this is a convention, okay? You know, it depends on the architecture, but the convention here, okay, so I'm just not gonna say convention is, you know, use a register to store the return value, especially when it is just a scalar. We do not have enough time in this class to talk about how to return the structure, which is a lot more interesting, but for scalars, like an integer, it's kinda just, okay, we'll pick a register. But it has to be a particular register because it's an agreement between the caller and the callee. Okay, so in this case, it'll use register A. Okay, so this is our convention of using the toy architecture. Is when you return a value from a subroutine, it would use register A to specify the return value. So given this, <clears throat> this particular subroutine in assembly. It's going to re be written as five, okay, because that's the entry point of the subroutine. It has its own label, and then there's nothing to do except to specify the return value of five, and then actually just return back to her, whoever called this subroutine. But it's a little bit tricky because um, once we use register A, we cannot use it to for anything else for the actual return sequence. Okay, so the first thing we do is LDI A with five, okay specify the return value, okay? Now, we, if we had the return instruction, that's the end of this, but we do not have a return instruction. Do, does anyone remember how do we get to the return address because we do not have a return instruction? Right. Didn't we reserve a space at the beginning of the 
function for the return address? Yep. And it's on the stack. You guys remember the stack? It's somewhere in memory yeah. that we have specifically designed for us to be able to count through and get to the top bottom of the stack. Right. Grab that piece and then. So we reserve a chunk of memory as the stack. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the stack pointer points to the very last thing that we push on the stack, the very last thing that we store in the stack. And we designate register blah as our stack pointer. Which one do we pick? D. Register D. D, very good. Okay, so register D is the stack pointer. So let me just kind of write here. Uh, and by the way, this document is available to you right now. It is being shared already. So if you have a tablet, a phone, or a computer, you can actually view it live as I you know, comment on it. So we go to, we say register D is the stack pointer. And at this point, the stack pointer, the stack register D points to the return address on the stack right now because there's nothing else on the stack, okay? You know, the return address is the last thing that the caller pushes on the stack in this case. So that means, you know, in parentheses D is where we want, is what we want to get. So the first thing we do is to say, okay, let's retrieve that, okay? So retrieving that is to use a LD instruction. The LD instruction is going to a particular memory location, grab its content, and put it into a register, okay? So in this case, I cannot use register A anymore, so I will use register B and say, let's go grab whatever register D is pointing to and put it into register B. Is that okay? And that is actually our return address. I cannot quite jump to B just yet because I have to deallocate the stack by increasing the stack pointer by one. Okay, so we gotta remember to undo or you know, um, deallocate that space so that we can use that space again. So this is where we need to use another register because I have just used up register A for the five. I suppose I can use register A again. I can do this later, okay? I can. I've got a way you can do it. Yep. You can load the immediate one into register C. Mm -hmm. And then simply add the again. Mm -hmm. And then we can see together. Right. But I want to see if I can you know, minimize the use of registers. So I can, I can reuse register A until the last moment. So I can do an LDIA with a one, and then we add one to A, I mean add A to D, which means to increment D by one. And then at this point, register A does not need to store that content of A anymore. I can now specify the other one. You know, we can actually now specify the return value. So I take this out, put it here, and now get register B, has the way has the place where we need to return to, so now it becomes just an unconditional branch to what B is pointing to. That's our return sequence. Are we doing okay so far with this? So I'm actually mixing in the specification of the return value with the return instruction itself. Is that okay? Where are we grabbing a return value from? It is from the stack. The stack pointer points to the return value. So which it is points to the number five. No. Or, yeah, return address you're talking about. Yeah, the return address which is pushed on the stack mm -hmm. by the caller is pointed to by D. Okay. So you're only looking at half of the code here because I'm not showing you what the caller is doing, but this is what the called subroutine is supposed to do. Yes? So return value so is still saved in register A. Stuff. Not on the stack, that is correct. So the return value is in register A and not on the stack. That's the convention used by most compilers. Because by using a register to specify the return value, it is faster, it's more efficient that way. Because most of the time, your, the return value of a C subroutine or even in C++ is gonna be an integer or something that can be stored in a register. Yep? for keeping return value? It is a convention used by the compiler, yes, but you're correct. It is an, it's an agreement that all the subroutines have to respect. Okay, very good, good point. Yep. So, so just register D is just storing, it's just 
referencing, or just arbitrarily use register, register D as the location? Um, on last Thursday, we basically said it's a convention, again, you know, with this compiler to use register D of the toy architecture as the stack point. Yep. But once again, it is just a convention. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's still a little bit confused, the LDI command. How the LDI? It, yeah. How does it get the value 1 to 5? Where does it find those? Aha! Yeah. Uh -huh. Now, this is where I can show you the, my really cool assembler. Okay, so we switch to the assembler, which is here. Okay, so the way you use the assembler is you go to the source code here. Okay, you can delete, you can do whatever you want with this sheet. Okay, so I'm going to delete all of this stuff here, which is not needed anymore. Get rid of all this. And if you go to the output, that should be empty now. Okay. And then go back to the source, and we go to cell A1. Okay, you have to start with cell A1. And if you do a control V to paste the content, it would actually paste whatever you have in your clipboard um, line by line into different cells. Okay. So when we go to the output of this particular program, yes, so it does work. I know it's off a little bit. I don't know exactly why it's off. Um, But this is the actual opcode. So the instruction LPI1 is this instruction here. 6C is the actual opcode of the instruction. But what the microcode of the opcode is going to do is to grab the byte next to the opcode and use that and copy that to whatever register you designate in the opcode itself. Is that helping? I just don't know why it leaves the first few lines empty. Did I have comments? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's why. <laughs> but this is the actual code corresponding to that particular program. So we can keep this one here, okay? You know, we, we can actually insert stuff you know, later on as well. Is that answer okay? Did I answer the question, the LDI question? Okay, good. Excellent. All right, so getting back to this example here. So the next question is, how do we utilize you know, uh, a subroutine like this? Okay, you know, show me some code that would actually call you know, five as a subroutine and make use of the result of five. Okay, so I'm gonna work on that code here. All right, so let's go ahead and define our main. <clears throat> Okay, so in this case, um, the return value of main really does not matter because you know in this case main does not have any place to return to. Okay, so I'm going to specify the main code here, and just for kaka, you know, I'm going to say, let's say you know we want to store the value of the sum of five into register a again. So this should be. So now we have to look at you know the main subroutine and say okay, but how do we translate this code? Okay, because I need to call five twice, get the return value of each one, add them up, and put it back into register A. So it sounds like register A is used a lot because every time you use five and call five, it uses register A, and it returns the value using register A. The next time you call five, it's going to mess up register A again. Okay. So we need a place to put register A, and we need to sort of the final result back into A as well. So this line here is going to be you know, expanded to quite a few lines in the assembly code. Okay, so let's figure out how we can do that. So five is already done, I'm not concerned about that one anymore. So now we need to implement main. What do you think I should do first with main? Just from the C perspective, okay, when you look at this line over here, what is the first thing that we should do? Should we change register A, or should we, can I do an add right now? What do I need to do first? Well, A is a register, so we don't need a label for that. But what do we need to do first? Look at the C statement, don't think in assembly. Look at the C statement and tell me what needs to be done first. But what is the very first thing I need to do with this line? Call five, okay? We need to call five first, okay? So let's go ahead and call five. Do you guys remember how to call a subroutine? No. 
jump. Well, okay, there's a little bit more than the jump because we have to first remember uh, to specify the return address. Okay, so we have a return address and we have several return addresses here. So we have a return address one, okay. That is, you know, right after the call, okay. Okay, so now that I have a label to designate the return address, what do we do, you know, to, where do we store the return address? The stack, very good. Okay, so we need to store the return address on the stack. And what is the, there are two things we need to do when we need to store something on the stack. What are those two things that we need to do regarding the stack pointer and the actual memory locations of the stack? There are two things we need to do. Remember the um, go digging example and the stakes? So, oh, you have to stake it first, right? Okay, so how do we stake the space that we need on the stack? Decrement by one. Decrement the stack pointer by one, very good. So the stack pointer points to the very last thing that was actually pushed on the stack. By decreasing the stack pointer by one, we have now reserved a new location that, is, that was previously unused. Okay, so we need to decrement the stack pointer by one. Okay, I think we, need to, we know how to do that. Uh, LDI A1, and then we just say uh, subtract um, the stack pointer by A, which is one, okay? So that will reserve the space that we need. What is the second thing we need to do when once we have reserved the space? So the stack pointer is now going to a space that is not used whatsoever, that is ready to store what I need to store now. So the next thing we need to do is to store the label, return address, to where D is pointing to. So yep. LDI 5A. LDI A. LDI A 5. Mm, not yet. Yep, go ahead. So where where is uh, where is D to begin with? D is initialized before main. Okay, you know, just like the other program, you know, we initialize D uh, to be zero because that's kind of two fifty five. It wraps around. And we're doing zero minus one. Yeah. So this is to initialize the stack pointer to location, and I'm going to put in quotes two fifty six because we don't really have two fifty six. But because it wraps around, so the moment you decrement from zero, it's going to be 255. It wraps around, which is the highest location of our toy processor in RAM. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, comment here. Okay, so this is for reserving a byte on the stack by decreasing the stack pointer by one. By decreasing the stack pointer by one. Okay, so the next instruction is really just to store what we need to store onto the stack. So we say LDIA with return address. Okay, I need to look at the label. Return address one. And we want to store it to what D is pointing to. So the instruction to use is ST, and then we use parentheses to indicate D reference. So this is uh, register D, whatever register D is pointing to, just store register A to that place. Okay. So store return address one to the stack. Yep. So for basically for the initial initialization of the stack, stack right before it would hit, it would just hit the end of available memory, however big that was. Correct. Yep. Yep. And since our RAM space is two hundred fifty six bytes, so yep. So that's why protocol zero is specifying 256. Okay. But if we had gigs upon gigs, it would just go to the end of the memory. Yep. Okay. It's kind of convention that you start at a high memory spot you know, for your stack. Um, for n modern processors, you know, does that, it doesn't have to be the case. But for older processors, where you don't have memory management built into um, the chip, you know, this is usually what people do. OK? All right. So now that we have saved the return address, in other words, the subroutine now has a place to go back to. Now it's time for us to actually go to the subroutine itself, right? Because you know, right now I'm just doing stuff from the caller's perspective. I have not really actually called or transferred control to the called subroutine. So that part can be done with an LDI A, and then the address of the subroutine in this case is five. And then we just say you know, JMPA. So that will jump or continue execution in five, 
5 will do its own thing, and then it will get back to return address. So let's just say that this is all done. When we get back to return address, what do we do? This is the first call to 5, which has the return value specified in register A, which is a constant 5. We need to call 5 again. Okay? So we need to call 5 again, but I need to do something first. Because if I just call 5 right now, it's going to clobber or overwrite register A, which has the return value. So let me just kind of write down here, okay? So do we want register A has the return value of the first call to 5. So do we want to store that onto the stack? Yes, we do. Very good. Okay, so excellent. So we want to <laughs> store this onto the stack. <laughs> You can see how the stack is extremely useful yeah. in you know, uh, C and C++. So I cannot use LDI A anymore because A actually has the return value right now. So I have to say LDI B1, okay? But basically go through the same procedure here. Subtract um, B from D, which means we reserve another byte on the stack. <coughs> and the next one is easy because we just have to store whatever A has onto the stack, where the stack point is pointing to. So now I have saved the return value of the first call to five on the stack. Now the registers are once again free. I can call five again or seven or whatever other subroutine I want to call. Is that okay? Okay, all right. So I just comment here and say um, the return value of the first call is saved on stack at this point. So what I need to do next is kind of the same thing as what we did earlier. So we do a LDI. I can use A again, okay? So if I want to be lazy, I can just do here with one little caveat, okay? So I need to point out the little caveat of copy and paste. I cannot just do this because the return address is gonna be, again, return address one, that won't work because now you have two definitions of the same label. So I have to use return address two in this case just so that you know, those two labels are different. Are we doing okay so far? Sort of, okay. Okay, so let me just comment what does it mean when I get to this point. When I get to this point, yeah, go ahead. The compiler does this a little bit differently. Yeah, okay. What the compiler it. does yeah. is um, when you need to specify a return address to, like the reference over here, the compiler knows you know, where this address is, and it just says, oh, I know exactly how long this sequence is. So it would just add a number of bytes immediately and figure out what the return label is, or what the return address is gonna be. So the compiler does it a little bit differently. So it'd be a particular address with with a, with a shift or something. Like a, with a with, like maybe with an offset attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Like maybe a, a, the, the first label with, with an offset. Right. So the compiler does it a little bit differently. Okay, so when we get to this point, we are now, you know, uh, we have just returned from the second call to five. So that means, you know, we have the result, the return value of the second call in register A and the return value of the first call on the stack. So let me just kind of comment on that here, okay? So register A has the return value from the second call, and whatever D points to, okay, well, okay, let's use a C notation. Whatever D points to has the return value from the first call, okay? So how do I add these two together? I probably don't want to mess around with uh, A too much because it already has part of the result, right? So I can use the other two registers. I still got register B and register C to mess around with, right? Okay, so what we really want to do is to say A plus equal to, this is what we want to do. Let me explain, let me scroll up first because I think people in the back cannot see this really well. Okay, so let me just highlight the one that I'm explaining right now. This is what I want to do. If I could do this, 
I would do this, okay? But I cannot. Okay, so let's look at the D plus plus. D plus plus means we are using the value of D right now, and then after this entire operation, add one to it. It's a post increment to deallocate the space that is currently used up to store the return value of the first call to five. Is that okay? So that's why we have a post increment of D. Star D is to de de reference D, because D is a stack order. It, it has the return value of the first call to five. We are only adding that value to what we already have in A, because guess what? A already has the return value of the second call to five. So I just need to add the, the, the return value of the first call to the return value of the second call and call it you're done. So this is what I want to do if I could do it in C++. But since I cannot, I have to translate that into assembly code. So let's see how much assembly code this is going to correspond to. It's not that bad, okay? It's not that bad. So the first thing we need to do is to put um, LD B D, okay, so we store the return value of the first call in register B because the stack pointer is pointing to the saved return value of the first call to 5. Okay, and then the next thing we need to do is to adjust the stack pointer. And well, okay, I, I'll do it in a slightly different way. So we will do an add first, okay, add AB. Which means you know I'm now adding the return value of the first call to the return value of the second call, and therefore accomplishing what we need to do. Yep. Go ahead. I thought at this point D was pointing to the return address. No, the return addresses are being allocated by the call by the call lead. See, you use up stacks when you're calling, but when you're returning, you free up that space. So is the code in between? Because I'm just looking at all the code at the moment, and it, it's got um, D it has been de uh, decremented, and it's storing the return address right. And then right. But this guy is going to deallocate that space. It's going to use it and deallocate it. So the call subroutine will do that. So the call to the subroutine is in between those two? The, the call actually happens right here. So at this instruction, the uh, execution will continue over here. Okay. And then at the very end of five, it will first retrieve the return address, yeah. and then it will deallocate the space used by the return address, yeah. and then it will transfer control back to this label, which is down here. That makes sense. I just it didn't click that LDI five and A was actually calling. So okay, that's that's cool. Good question. So just remember, the caller is the one that is allocating and putting the return value on the stack. The callee or the call subroutine is responsible to grab that return value and free up that space you know, used by the return value. So when you're adding them to right here, you're adding five with five or? Yeah, I'm adding five to five. So that should be 10, right? But as good programming practice, I really should do that increment as well. So I'm just going to do that, LDIB with 1, and add D with B. Even though this is right before the halt instruction, you know, I should balance the stack all the time. Okay? So this is the entire program. This is the entire code corresponding to this little C program here. <laughs> But are there any questions? Okay, you know, the tricky part is not five itself, okay? Because five itself, you know, on top of what we already talked about last Thursday, the only thing added today is, oh, the return value is already register A by convention. Okay, so that's that's the easy part. The difficult part is with main because we have to find a place to store the return value of the first call to five so that we don't so that we can use that value later. So this is going to be helpful for our subroutine, for our factorial subroutine, because in our factorial subroutine, we also need a space to store the value of the parameter, because we need to get it back in order to do the multiplication. Is that okay so far? All right. 
So let's go ahead and check out this code and see whether, first of all, does it assemble? And two, if it does assemble, does it run as we expected? Okay. So we'll go ahead and grab all the mnemonics. Okay, up to this point. Control C, go to the assembler spreadsheet, paste it to A1 in the uh, tab or sheet called source, and go to the output. Okay, looks like uh, looks like it worked. So your oh. assembler works in the spreadsheet. Yes. Right? So the entire thing is done using Google Documents. Wow. It's all cloud based and open source because you know you can mm -hmm. you guys can you know, make a copy of all of these files and do whatever you want. <laughs> yep. Is there a way to use like internal files to input output to Say that one more time. Is there a way to use internal files to input and output from this Google document? Like, could you use Google Docs, like the spreadsheet, as essentially an assembly? Like, that the computer could use with a compiler to go from code to code? Does that make sense? So well, like, this, this right here is user input output. So you're, you're putting in your own code and it's right, right. something. Oh, to make it read a file as the input. Yeah, like using this. Hmm. I'm not as uh, I'm not sure about that because when you look at this, it has import. But when it imports, I think it imports the entire file as a document, and not as a part of a sheet. So you might want to look into insert. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it has a way to do that. Just to import a file from your computer into a particular part of a particular sheet. I don't think it has that feature. Possibly you can do it using your own macro, okay? but I'm not, I, I haven't looked into that yet. Okay, so we'll switch back to the output. Okay, so now it's time to copy this content into the simulator. So we have to fire up the simulator for the first time okay, today. Um, it's gonna be in Downloads, logic sim, and it's going to be downloads processor, um, processor dot circ. There we go. Okay, and then go to the RAM part of it. Well, we will go ahead and make sure that we reset it first, and make sure the ROM has all the microcode. Double check. Content. Yep. So it looks like it has all the opcodes. So now we can specify the actual. It has all the microcode. Now we can specify the opcode. So we edit content. Put so here. How difficult was it to write an assembler in Google Spreadsheet? Yeah. You mean this one? Yeah. You just have to do it step by step. You know, like you know, you, you clean up you know the input line and then you. You, think, you try to figure out, okay, how do we extract just the opcode, you know, the mnemonic itself, mm -hmm. to look up which role of the mnemonic I should use. So it's just a matter of looking up your functions in uh, the spreadsheet. Was it if statements? Or There's a whole bunch of stuff. There's a bunch of ifs, yeah, and there are, um, the spreadsheet has a lot of features for looking up things, mm -hmm. and then there are some regular expression involved, you know, to extract more different parts of a line and stuff like that. So it took me a little bit of time to kind of find out what a spreadsheet can do in terms of text processing. Mm -hmm. So once I figure out what it can do, then it's just a matter of you know combining those things to do what I needed to do. So like it'll search if it's like LDI, it'll go to a spreadsheet that has the right. opcode of LDI and all the conversion. And yep. Oh, that's, that's really cool. And oh, actually, the program is a little bit longer than that <laughs> because I have a lot of a lot of lines of comments which is not shown here. Okay, so let's type in the program, 6F, 6F, uh, 006C, 01. I thought about getting an auto export, you know, so that I don't have to type it in by hand. So we have another 6C, 0B, F3. Okay, I'm also double checking, you know, to make sure that I'm at the right location. 08 is corresponding to 08 here. So we got 6C, 1E, B1. We 
Okay, I think this will help a little bit so I don't have to <laughs> go too far. Okay, we have B1, 6D, 1, 9C, F3, 6C, and, uh oh, I lost track. 6C, 01, 9C. Okay, so. Okay, this is location 1, 2. So we have a 6C. 1, 8, F3, 6, F6C, six 1E, B1. This is location uh, 17, that is correct. I'm just double checking, cross checking you know, as I enter the code because if I enter it you know, off by one, you know, then the program is not gonna work. 806D, 01, 8C, 01, 7766C, 01, 8C, 6C, 05, and B1. There we go. Double checking. Is this location 24? And it is. Okay, very good. So we'll go ahead and save this file. I'll save this file as um, 5, okay, 2x5, okay, 2x5 dot uh, RAM. Okay, there we go. We save it. So is that like an executable almost that you can build? It is. Well, okay, it's not the same thing as an executable, yeah, which is a file. But this is the core content of what an executable has. So this is the code. So let's say you're writing a CPP file. Mm -hmm. We'll convert it into this code, load this code into RAM, and then. Mm -hmm. In the case of an operating system, there are a few more steps because mm -hmm. the operating system has a component called a loader. The loader would look at the executable to figure out what portion of the program gets loaded into which portion in RAM because you have initialized variables, for instance, that goes into a particular portion of RAM, and then the actual executable code goes into another portion of RAM, and then uninitialized you know, variables possibly go to yet another chunk of RAM. So the loader is responsible to do that, and the loader can also relocate your code a little bit, off by a little bit, so that your code doesn't always start at the same place to kind of help deter um, stack overflow exploits and all other kinds of exploits. So there's a, a few more steps involved when you have an operating system, but the concept is the same. This is, you know, basically the core content of an executable. Wow. Yep. Is there a way to hack a loader? You <laughs> not easily because it is a part of the kernel of an operating system, so it's kind of deep inside an operating system, so it's not easily hacked. But there's a way. <laughs> well, if they program it incorrectly, there probably is a way. There's a way to hack a lot of things, though, right? Oh yeah, just just look uh, look up BART, San Francisco uh, Public Transit. Mm -hmm. I think their website or their system got hacked. What? Not BART, um, Muni, San Francisco Muni got hacked. All right, so back to the processor. We got the RAM, you know, and let's see. We go to simulate, and we'll just to go crank up the tick frequency, two kilohertz. Do I feel confident? This will happen in no time when you do two kilohertz. So what are we... Uh, what we should be expecting is yes. by the time we get to the very last instruction, um, register A should contain the value of 10 because it is 5 plus 5. Okay, yes. so that's what we are expecting. Six so we say take enabled, and the program seems to be running. The clock is clicking, and we can look at the program counter because when the program counter gets to, I'm pretty sure it's done already, okay? Yeah, but <laughs> when the program counter gets to the halt instruction, which is, where's the halt instruction? The halt instruction is on uh, row 37, so it should be, at the output, it should be row 38. This 01, so by the time we get to, uh, when PC is 1D, it means we are all done. And when we examine the register bank, we should see a 10. 
or 0a because it's, it's in hexadecimal, and register a. Okay, so let's switch back to the simulator and ask it to stop for a moment. And let's double check all, that, all of that stuff. Okay, so we'll go check the program counter. The program counter is at 0b. That's not the right place. And let's go check register A. Register A has a 1E. So the program did not work. Okay, we are stuck at uh, location B. So what do we do? Why are we stuck at location B? Well, we need to debug the program, just like just as usual. So this is location B. It is supposed to have a 6001. And when we go back to the processor, okay. Wow, that was probably why I was so freaking dead. There was Rising Tide Damn Beauty for free. That one weekend? Yeah. Okay, so the clock cycle is not doing anything here. And it's trying to execute at B10, which is all zeros. <laughs> oh, so I didn't, I, did, I forgot to load the. Uh, all that ROM into the ROM again. <laughs> let me let me just double check, make sure that is really the case. I'm pretty sure about that. Hmm. Is B one? But why is it at location? Oh, location B one. Okay, it is an actual opcode, but we don't have any microcode corresponding to that code. And I'm just done to double check because because this is my own tool chain. I could have made a bug in this entire tool chain. So I need to make sure that B1 is the instruction or the opcode of the instruction that I want. So let's see, B1 is corresponding to a jump instruction. Yep, that's legit. <laughs> okay, fine. Operator error. So we'll load image from uh, all.rom. And there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. Reset and reload the ROM, the RAM itself, load image, and it, this is called um, 2x5. Open again. OK, let it rip. Mm -hmm. OK, let's check out uh, the program counter. No, it's stuck at 6. And <laughs> that's not a very good place in the is it oh, it's using a B. Oh, it's running. It's using B as an instruction, which we do not have. So it 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 went to a place that is not supposed to go to. And the program counter is six. So when you look up the actual output here, at location six, sure enough, we have zero B. So it's off by one. It is not getting back to the right place. Okay. So at this point, we have several ways to debug the program. Okay. You can single step, okay? You just kind of threw out the whole thing and figure out you know, when it went back. You can turn on logging, okay? And then we can do the auto-click thing and just you know, look at the log sequence and find out, you know, okay, where did it you know, mess up, okay? Or we can insert you know, halt instructions everywhere. <laughs> and see which one it got to. Yep. So it's supposed to be putting, or it's supposed to be looking at um, the RAM location of zero B, but it's actually trying to implement. It's trying to execute. Yeah, zero B is supposed to be the immediate constant of this LDI instruction, but somehow you know con uh, execution continue at this point, and I know what it is. Okay, I. I think it has to do with, um, this is location 5, okay? And we have a return value of 5. So I'm, I'm kind of guessing that is the case. So let me show you some of the debugging tools available in LogiSim. <clears throat> so first of all, stop all this. Reset the whole program. Reload the program itself without any changes. So we re reload um, 2x5. There we go. And then we go to simulate and we go to logging. This is actually a very, very useful feature. Um, whenever you work with any type of programming or development tools, C, C++, um, code blocks, or whatever tool that you are using, always look into debugging 
you know, uh, features. Okay, so in LogiSim, this is one of the debugging features. I'm not going to log too much stuff because if I log too much stuff, it's hard to kind of go through it. So all I'm going to do is to log uh, the PC, which is the program counter, and I will probably also log. I'm guessing the micro code to your pointer too. Okay, so we'll log that one as well. There we go. And you know, if you want to, you can actually log you know uh, the subcomponents of a particular component. But I'm not going to do that. Okay, so I'm just going to log the PC and the microcode uh, pointer, and we can specify the file. Okay, so it is currently disabled. So I'm going to store the log into um, 2x5.log. So this becomes my actual output, you know, for this particular, you know, run. And at this point, I can still do the Control T thing. You know, so I can still manually kind of go through it. So I can see, you know, just by hand, what it's doing, and this is a return back to the main subroutine. This is a jump, and this is this is where it happened. I think it jumped to the wrong place. Hmm. Yeah, it just went all the way to the back, it went back to the beginning of the entire program. Okay, so at this point I know the program has already failed, so let's go ahead and check out the output of the log file. And it's called 2x5.log. There we go, so we can look at the PC and see how it changes. Unfortunately, this is all in binary, but we can kind of interpret binary pretty easily. The return statement is going to make it go back to an earlier place, so the program counter will basically go back to an earlier place at some point, right here. So in this case, it returned to location 5. We want to double check the source code and make sure that that does make sense. So we have to go back to the spreadsheet and say, does it make sense to go back to location 5? It does, okay, and location 5 is corresponding to row 6 of the source code, and when we look up row 6 of the source code, hmm, that is not, that's not what we want, that's not what we want. it went to the wrong place. So we know the return instruction is the problem, okay, because we transfer control to the subroutine without any problems, now how do we know that? Let's look up the label 5 and find out how it's defined. Okay, so we can go to assemble would do it because you know, when you look up 5 on this row 39, uh, 5 is location 1, uh, 3, 0 in hexadecimal. So when we go through the trace here, location 1, 1, 0, 0, location oh, 3, 0. Three zero is a zero zero one one, and then all zeros with the other one. So we have zero down. down. Three zero one one. But why would it mess around with these instructions? That's wrong. That is already it has already gone bad at this point. It never got to the one one zero zero, so it never called the subroutine. Don't you just love debugging? I love debugging. This is actually what I really enjoy doing, especially when the bug is not mine. But in this case, it is mine. So, <laughs> <coughs> okay, so we we can kind of tell you know when it kind of went bad because from location one zero one one, it jumped all the way to location zero 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 one. One 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 zero. This is in hexadecimal. This is one e. So it went to location one e from location uh, zero b. Okay. So then we have to register a somehow. So it went from location zero b to location one e. Location one e did end up in the register bay. Yes. So this is where you know where things you know went wrong, and we want to go back to the source code and find out you know what is that what are those locations corresponding to. 
So location t zero B is this instruction. It's uh, is a LDI B with one, which it should not cause a jump. Is six D LDI or is it supposed to be six C? Uh, depends on which register. I think 6D is LDIB oh. with a different register. And we we look into which row was it again? Row 15. So, row so it's row 14 of the source. So it's this one. Hmm. Well, that tells me the assembler itself may be to blame. It may be generating the wrong opcode or the microcode corresponding to uh, 6. B or 6D is incorrect because none of this code is supposed to jump at all <laughs> and yet it did all right well let's double check so let's go to the mnemonics and look at the mnemonics and we look at LDI it's a 6C and we expect only one single register this is the register X And the amount of uh, shifting it should do is just zero. So 6D is, in fact, the correct opcode. So if 6D is the right opcode, then we go back into the simulator and find out whether the ROM has the right code at 6D. Okay, so this is the halt instruction, by the way. It's already halting. Oh, maybe it did finish executing everything. Never halted. It just keeps reading. Oh right, this is a this is the no op instruction. Okay, so let's check out location six D zero. So six D zero does have the content specified, but it's not doing what it is supposed to. It looks to be correct based on the op code. Mm hmm. Six C we know is correct, but six D somehow is not running correctly. Say that one more time. Those are specifying bits in our bit pattern that you would have defined way back in the day in that one big spreadsheet. But they end up they end up defining. They do end up defining the particular registers you want to use. Yes. When you add one to this, you know what you should get uh, a one. This is a B, so C is one one zero zero. So it's the PC definitely does not go to the right place. But you know what? Logisim itself can be buggy. <laughs> it's like blaming the compiler. Well, sometimes it can be the compiler. Sorry? You looked through it, and hmm? it's still messed up. It's not like you ran it at 2K. Yep, so I'm going to restart you know, Logisim and see if that is the issue. So we'll Just don't in. tell Fox it's the compiler, because he won't believe you. <laughs> I used to develop, you know, compilers, mm -hmm. so I have that uh, nagging feeling sometimes. <laughs> I was writing a program for 4.30 the other day, and it had a memory spot where the array only holds 10 elements, mm -hmm. but there was a point where it was loading an 11th element into the array, even though it doesn't hold 11 elements. So it was tricky. And there it, are weird bugs like that. that it, C and C and C++ will actually load extra pieces into an array. Yeah, that's what it was doing. So but it might override something else that was already there. Yeah, so okay, so we have a reset. And just to be sure, we're going to reload all that ROM into here. Okay. And then we go to RAM and then reload to x5.ram. And then turn on the debugging. Go to logging. We want to add PC to the to the whole thing. Um, go to file and then specify the same file is fine. You know I can override it. Okay, and this time it went just Control T. Okay, so this is the initialization of the stack pointer, and this is the this is actually in main. It is preparing to call the subroutine. So it's a loading of one into register A. Um, and then it subtracts one from register D with this instruction. That's a subtraction. 
and now it's loading um, register A, it's LDI A with B, which I think is the destination address, like that. And then F3 is the jump to go into the subroutine. So after the F3, we should be at 0B. Oh, no, this is the, uh, this is one actually stores the return address. So 0B is the return address. So now that we are back to here, we are loading, this 1E is the uh, destination, which is the subroutine. And the B1 is the jump, unconditional branch to the subroutine. So after this, we should be at location 1E. Okay, this is location 1E. So we got into location 1E correctly. Um, and this is immediately the return you know, uh, code sequence. So this is the one to retrieve the return address into register B. And then we increase the stack pointer by one. So this is the actual ad. That's the actual ad right there. And then we the LDI five. Okay. This is the return address. But this is the uh, this is the actual return value. That's the return value itself. Okay. And B one is a unconditional branch using register. The wrong register. Which register is it using? I should be using register B. But I think it's use, I think it's using register A. Which is why it's jumping back to zero five, which is why we're having all those loop issues. Yep. No, no, it's register B. Okay, so maybe it's it's generating the wrong code then. Okay. So jump B should be giving us what B two. I'm looking up the table right now because it's it's table it's it's table driven. Okay. So jump has a base code of B one, and. The register is sh is supposed to be shifted by two. I think I forgot. No, it's supposed to be shifted, no, by, two. shifted by two. Hmm. So this this instruction did not get assembled correctly. Okay. So now we have located the source of the problem being the tool itself, because this instruction is the one that is not being um, assembled correctly. Because the base code is a, is a B one already. And yet, the actual opcode is also a B1, so it's not shifted correctly. So is the table lock not hooked up? Or so is and I think I know why, because I was, it was, it was my, my own stupidity, because I forgot to copy these rows all the way down to row 100. Ah. Oh. OK. So it's a theoretically easy fix. It is a very easy fix. but. It is embarrassing, very embarrassing. Dang, you missed a lot. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Okay, let's okay. let's double check. Okay. What's after <laughs> row forty six? Is there anything after row forty six or um no row forty six is the last, last one. one. Yeah. So the only one that makes any difference to is that last row. Yep. So then all I have to do is change that one B one to a B five and we're good. Yep, so this should be a B5. All right, because it's the last one. So we only have one location to change. One location to change. Okay, let's do that. Let's do that. 24 to B5. And content, B5, B5. Save again. Because <laughs> I'm going to reset the whole thing before I run it again. So reset. Now just let it click. <laughs> load 2x5.ram Do you guys want to let it rip? Let it rip. Do it. Okay, tick frequency. Let's make it click a little slower. Yep, looks, looks okay. This is the second call. Mm, doesn't look like it's working. 
it should uh, have. Oh, it did. It, uh, it worked. It worked. Your halt instruction last, last yep, thing. that's the so halt instruction. Are you sure it worked? Well, yeah. go to the register okay, so let's 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 stop the ticking and find out. Okay, the program counter should be on the halt instruction, one which e. is one e, and it is, and it, is ha it has an instruction of zero one. So the actual thing that we need to check is in the register bank and make sure that register A has a value of 10. It does. Yes, it does. So it does work. Nice. Why does the Klingon say, kapa? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but this is, I find this you know, an interesting process you know, because I'm trying to troubleshoot. As it turns out, it was a problem with the tool itself. I forgot to copy you know, all the rows you know, all the way down. But the process to find the problem is something that I don't know. I mean, do you guys learn that from your classes? I use it every day. What? No, the the uh, debugging techniques. No. Like what I just went through. You don't do that. We, I like debug when I'm but it's more like, hey, that's no. sorry. What did GCC I do wrong? <laughs> GCC is pretty stable, but when you have problems in your own code, you still have to kind of logically try to deduce and find out where it went down. Oh, I use the outstanding. Is that the worst way to debug? Not the worst. It's just not a. Um, it's not very structured. Oh yeah, I do that. 